Hello, this is Professor White, and I'll be discussing about genetic engineering. Now, what is genetic engineering? Well, genetic engineering is changing the DNA in the living organisms to create something new. Now, the organisms are usually called genetically modified organisms. For example, bacteria that produce the human insulin is basically a genetically modified organism. Now, genetically modified organisms are called transgenic organisms, meaning since genes are transferred from one organism to another, that's why it's called transgenic. Now, some genetic engineering techniques are as follows. First, the most common is actually artificial selection, uh, which includes selective breeding, hybridization, and inbreeding. Now, the second one is cloning. The third is gene splicing, and gel electrophoresis, which is analyzing the DNA. Now, artificial selection is a technique wherein breeders choose which organisms to mate to produce offspring with the desired traits. Now, they cannot control what genes are passed, but when they get offspring with the desired traits, it maintains that trait over and over. Now, there are three types of artificial selection selective breeding, hybridization, and in breeding. Now let's discuss first the selective breeding. Now selective breeding is when animals with desired characteristics are mated to produce offspring with those desired traits, which is passing on important genes to the next generation. For example, champion race horses, cows with tender meat, or large juicy oranges on a tree are actually selectively uh, bred so that this desired trait is passed on to the next generation. Another example is when people breed dogs for specific purposes, like the dachshund were once bred to hunt badgers and other uh, burrowing animals. So they must be small to fit into the animal's hole in the ground. So that's why they breed these dogs for specific purposes. Now, selective breeding occurs when you choose the best male and female to breed. Now, this allows to fine tune and control the traits. Now, the offspring or babies will then have the best trait. Then you continue to breed those organisms with the best traits, and those traits will be maintained. Here are some examples of selective breeding. So, Angus cows are bred to increase the muscle mass so that they will get more meat. Um, there's also this one, if, as you can see over here in this um, slide right there, wherein this cow is really muscular. They actually call that your Belgian blue cow. So that's very interesting. And then also um, egg laying hen produces more eggs than the average. So that's another example of selective breeding. Now let's go move on to hybridization. Now hybridization is when two individuals with unlike characteristics are crossed to produce the best in both organisms. For example, Luther Burbank created a disease resistant to potato called Burbank potatoes. So he crossed a disease resistant plant with one that had a large food producing capacity. So the result is it's disease resistant plant that makes a lot of potatoes. So that is called hybridization. Here are some other examples of um, a hybridization wherein the lion and tiger are mixed. So you call it a liger. So that's another example of hybridization. Another example is the grape and apple. I'm sure you guys have seen this. It's a grapple. So the fruit tastes like grapes and looks like apple. So that's hybridization. Now the next one is inbreeding. Now inbreeding is wherein we breed organisms that are genetically alike to maintain their traits. Usually this is with dogs. Now dogs breed are kept pure this way. So it is how a, a Doberman remains a Doberman. It keeps each breed unique from the other. The risk though is that since both have the same genes, the chance uh, that a baby will get a recessive genetic disorder is very high, such as blindness or joint deformities. Now let's talk about variation. Now variation is the differences between individual species. Species. Now, the differences are in the genes, but we see the physical differences. For example, some humans have blonde hair and some have brown hair. This is a variation among humans. Now, some finches have short beaks, some are long beaks, and with inbreeding, it actually decreases variation. Now, let's move on to cloning. Now, cloning is creating an organism that is an exact genetic copy 
of another. Now, there are human clones in our school, such as the identical twins that are naturally created clones. Now, clones are a group of cells or organisms that are genetically identical as a result of asexual reproduction. Now, they will have the same exact DNA as the parents. Now, how is cloning done? Well, a single cell is removed from a parent organism. An entire individual is grown from that cell. And remember, one cell has all the DNA needed to make an entire organism. Now, each cell in the body has the same DNA, but cells vary because different genes are turned on in each cell. Now, an example of a cloned organism is Dolly. Now, Dolly is the first mammal clone, and she had the same exact DNA as her mother and had no father. So cloning is a form of asexual reproduction. So it only comes from one genetic parent. So since Dolly, cats and other organisms have been cloned. Now, the cat that was once cloned had the same exact DNA, but different color fur than the mother. How can this be? Well, environment plays a huge part in the way organisms develop. Now, as we recall, eggs are haploid. Haploid means half the chromosomes, which is 23 in humans. Now, body cells are diploid. There's two sets of chromosomes, one from the mom and one from the dad, which is 46 in humans. Now, how could you clone a human? Here you go. <laughs> well, step one, the egg is removed from a female human. Now, eggs are haploid, 23 chromosomes. Now, the nucleus of the egg is removed and is thrown away, okay? Now, step two, a body cell is removed from another person. Now, the nucleus of the body cell is removed, so the body cells are 46 chromosomes. Now, the third step, the nucleus of the diploid body cell is put into the egg. Now, the egg no longer needs to be fertilized since it has 46 chromosomes. Now the egg is then charged with electricity to start mitosis, kind of like a jump start. And then step five, then it put into a surrogate mother so that it can grow. Now it's going to be genetically identical to the parent of the body cell, but it will be a baby. Now plants and animals can be cloned technically speaking, but ethically, I don't think so. So here's a, a diagram of um, the process of cloning right here. Now, what are the benefits of cloning? Well, you can make exact copies of organisms with strong traits. It also increases food supply. Now, for medical purposes, clone organs for transplant is beneficial and maybe bring back or stop species from going extinct. So these are some benefits. Now, what are the risks? Of course, decreases genetic diversity. If one of your clones get a disease, they all get it and save immune system unfortunately. So it decreases genetic diversity in effect. Now it is inefficient because there is a very high failure rate, 90 plus percent. And last but not least is expensive. With the technology that we have, it is very expensive, even if we do have that technology available. Now let's go to gene splicing. Now gene splicing is when DNA is cut out of one organism and put into another. Now a trait will be transferred from one organism to another. For example, the human insulin gene can be removed from the human cell. It can be put in a bacterial cell and that bacterial cell will now make the human insulin. Now this picture represents gene splicing, kind of like showing it. However, the DNA is much, much smaller. It's done with a high-tech lab equipment since the DNA is too small to hold or see without a microscope. But this is kind of like just a comparison of if we're going to picture it out. So the red piece the woman is holding is the insulin gene from a human being. It is being combined with the DNA from a bacteria and it creates a, what we call a recombinant DNA, something that has never existed before. So what is the benefit of growing that human insulin gene? Well, insulin is cheaper now because we can grow and we can have insulin gene, you know, produced. Now there is no side effects because it is human insulin. Now we once used pigs insulin, but there are side effects and it's more expensive. But now that we can actually put the human insulin gene in bacteria and then the bacteria reproduce or produce more human insulin gene, that's what makes it more affordable than it used to be.
Now, how are genes cut for gene splicing? Well, a bacterial plasmid is used. Now, what is a plasmid? This is a circular DNA in the bacterial cell, and it is very simple and easy to manipulate. So there is what we call a restriction enzyme. So when you say restriction enzyme, these are enzymes that cut the DNA that's specific code. Now, there are thousands of restriction enzymes. Now, each cuts DNA at different sequence. Some look for GGCC and cut between G and C. And every time GGCC is found in the DNA, it is cut by the restriction enzyme. So if this is a DNA code, every time that the restriction enzyme sees GGCC, it cuts there. So that's why I tell restriction, kind of like scissors. So in this case, once every time that the restriction enzyme cuts, between G and C, for example, then this DNA sequence is cut, creating fragments. In this case, we have three fragments that are cut. Since everyone is different, we all have different amounts of, or a different amount of how many times the GGCC is found in a DNA sequence. My DNA might be different and can be cut seven times maybe yours 10 times. So that's that's what restriction enzyme is. And I'll show you a little animation of how a restriction enzyme looks like. So as you can see, that's your restriction enzyme. And it's going to look for that code or sequence and it cuts it. So that's basically what your restriction enzyme does. So how is gene splicing done? Well, a restriction enzyme cuts the insulin gene out of the human DNA. Now, a plasmid is removed from a bacteria and cut with a restriction enzyme. So the plasmid also cut bacterial DNA. Okay, so the human gene is placed into the bacteria plasmid. Now, the plasmid is placed back into the bacteria. Now, the cell now has directions the DNA sequence to make the insulin. And that's exactly what it does. So it's human insulin. Bacteria do not make the insulin in their own because it kind of like incorporates in that plasmid. And then that plasmid has that sequence of the insulin gene. And then when they reproduce or asexually reproduce, then you'll have more and more of that insulin, human insulin gene incorporated in that plasmid. So it is called transformation. This is when a gene from one organism is transferred to a different organism. So the human gene, the human insulin gene is transferred to the bacterial plasmid causing its transformation. Now the, the organisms that have DNA transferred to them are called transgenic organisms. Trans means different, genic means genes. So genetic engineering has actually given rise to a new technology in the field, which is called biotechnology, or you call that technology of life. Now, transgenic animals, these are animals wherein their genes are inserted into animals, so they produce what humans need. Why? Because it's a way to improve our food supply, such as the transgenic cows. So genes are inserted to the cows to increase milk production. So it's kind of like the idea of the human insulin. They insert it to them so they can increase their milk production. Another is spider goat. So spider goat, these are uh, the genes from a spider is inserted into the goat. Now the goats make silk of the spider web in their milk, which makes the their wool flexible, stronger than steel, which is used in bulletproof jacket. So that's that's another transgenic organism. Another interesting example is your glow-in-the-dark cats. Now they use um, a virus to insert DNA from jellyfish. Now the gene made the cat produce a fluorescent protein in its fur. So that's another transgenic animal. And of course, your transgenic bacteria, wherein the genes are inserted into the bacteria, so they produce things humans need especially our insulin and also some um, clotting factors in blood are now made by bacteria. Now, how about plants? Transgenic plants. These are plants uh, that are given genes so they meet human needs. An example is your transgenic corn. So corns are given a gene so that they could produce natural pesticide. Now, they don't have to be sprayed with cancer-causing pesticides. So 25% of all corns are basically like this 
nowadays. Another is your venomous cabbage. Now, genes from scorpion tails inserted into the cabbage. Now, the cabbage produces uh, that chemical. Why it actually limits pesticide use while still preventing insects from damaging the crops. Corporations state that toxins is modified so it isn't harmful to humans. So that toxins is actually not um, harmful to us, but for pests only. Another is banana vaccines. Now, virus is injected into a banana. Now, the virus DNA becomes a part of the plant. Now, as the plant grows, it produces the virus proteins, but not the disease part of the virus. Now, when people eat a bite, their immune system creates antibodies to fight the disease, just like a traditional vaccine, like a vaccine for hepatitis or cholera. So these are your banana vaccines. Very interesting. Now let's move on to gene therapy. Now gene therapy is when disease causing genes are cut out and good genes are inserted. So bad genes out, insert good genes. Now restriction enzymes, just like what we talked about earlier, are used to cut out these bad genes. Now viruses are used to insert the good genes. Now this is not approved for humans use just yet because there are some possible side effects. But gene therapy is, is a good um, concept when you think about it. Lastly, I will discuss about gel electrophoresis, which is a technique used to compare the DNA from two or more organisms. So why do we compare um, DNA? Well, number one application is to find someone's baby daddy, um, someone who committed a crime, or how close these species are related. I'm sure you guys have heard about 23andMe, Ancestry, and stuff like that. So that is what gel electrophoresis is used. Now, how is it used? Well, the DNA is cut into fragments with the restriction enzymes. Now, the cut DNA is then put into wells of a machine filled with gel. Now, the gel is very spongy, kind of like a jello, and the DNA squeezes through the pores of these gel. As you can see over here, the machine is plugged in and the fragments uh, get separated based on their size. Now, the smaller fragments move further than the large ones. As you can see here in this um, animation, the separation of DNA is actually happening. And the result is the separation of these bands, as we call it. So the electricity actually provides the energy for the DNA to move. So why does the DNA move? Well, the DNA has negative charge. When the machine is plugged, it moves towards the positive pole created by the electricity, as you can see here. And electrophoresis is very useful when you want to compare the DNA from a suspect and a DNA from a blood stain in a crime scene, for example, because your DNA is so unique that it is actually a DNA fingerprint. And gel electrophoresis will separate your DNA differently from anyone else. I hope you've enjoyed and you've learned something today about genetic engineering. This is a very interesting topic, which I really enjoy, and I hope that you understand it the simplest way possible. If you have any questions, please let me know and I will see you in class. Bye.